Hi, I am Mrs. Sloan, and this is a video intended for my honors biology students. Um, we are in a unit on the central dogma, DNA to RNA to protein. And today what we're gonna talk about is viruses and how they hijack our central dogma, our pathway of information, and get our very own cells to make the proteins and, of what they want. All right, so let me make myself a little bit smaller and get in presentation mode. If you are new um, to my videos, down in the descriptor of this video, you will see a link to the notes my students use. Two columns. Column one is a scaffolding. I'll help you fill that in. Column two, I encourage you to put in pictures that are helpful for you. So this is chapter 28, and we are jumping to section 28.5 um, just to talk about viruses, viroids, and proteins. And I think we all know who this is right here. Yes, Mr. Coronavirus. All right. So so what is a virus? A virus is a microscopic pirate. Um, it's associated with disease and it is host specific and probably evolved from the host that it infects right now. So here below me, you can just see a, a bunch of viral art of different viruses. So on your notes, what is a virus? It is associated with disease and it is host specific. Okay. It is known as an obligate intracellular, intra means within, an obligate intracellular parasite. So let's compare and contrast, let me move myself, let's compare and contrast a prokaryotic cell with a, vir with a virus. Okay, Viruses are not really considered alive because they don't have the characteristics of life. Remember those living things are organized made of cells? Well, viruses aren't. Okay, they do, they do not consist of cells, they cannot metabolize, they cannot respond to stimuli, the only way they can reproduce is inside of a host. Um, and um, can they evolve? Yes, because what is evolution? It's just a change in your nucleic acid, just a change in the allele frequency, so they can do that. So on your notes, you have obligate intracellular parasites. They have, a nuclea sorry, have nucleic acids can evolve, but require a host to replicate. They require a host to replicate. They have no metabolism, other characteristics of life. So um, viruses by size, they are smaller than a ribosome. Remember what a ribosome is for, the site of protein synthesis? They are smaller than that. Here you can see bacteria, chlamydia, that's an STD. Here's a pox virus, herpes, influenza. So you can see a little bit of the scale. Now what all viruses contain for sure is a protein capsid and a nucleic acid core. Now they may or may not contain other enzymes, but for sure protein capsid, nucleic acid, core. So if we look here, okay, let's look at the different kinds of nucleic acids they can have. They can have DNA or they can have RNA. That DNA could be double-stranded DNA um, or it could be a single-stranded nucle um, nucleic acid. Um, RNA could be um, single-stranded or it could be double-stranded. And you remember in DNA how we talked about leading and lagging strands, right? So the same thing for the virus. Um, it can have like leading and lagging strands. Strands that it can translate immediately um, are the plus strands. And those can immediately, that means if it's an RNA virus, it goes in and just like you and I may Make mRNA for our cells, that message, it just comes in and gives our cells the message and boom, we start translating it on our ribosomes. So on your notes, um, I'm still not there yet. Hang on, that was, we'll get to that, sorry. So where did viruses come from? This is where we are on the notes. They could have evolved before the three domains. Remember your three domains? Think, 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 right? Archaea, bacteria, and eukarya, those are our three domains. They could have evolved before that or because they are host specific, they could have evolved from hosts. Remember how we, we have all this RNA in our cells. We also cut out, right, introns and leave the exons. Um, so in, for eukaryotic control of gene expression, so could have come from any of those. Um, so on your notes, you have all of that before, during, or after cells evolved. Um, how are viruses classified? They are classified by what kind of nucleic acid they have. Remember I told you it could be DNA or RNA, it could be single-stranded or double-stranded, the size, their capsid, the size and shape of it, and whether or not they have an outer envelope. They don't have to have an outer envelope, but sometimes they do. So take a look right here on this virus particle. 
Okay, it has a protein capsid. It may or may not have an envelope on the outside. Inside, it has to have a nucleic acid, and it could have some other proteins that may or may not. So take a look at this envelope virus right over here to the, to the right. You can see the protein capsid that's in blue, okay? Here is its nucleic acid that's in red, and then it has this envelope right here on the outside. Now on this envelope, do you see where it says spike projections? I need a pointer. Okay, these spike projections can help them gain access to our cells. Because what do we have outside of our cells? What do we call those? Receptors, right? So it basically gives them the ability to dock to our dock into our cells and turn them on. All right, now. Okay, sorry, I had to go turn on the air conditioning, I'm melting. Okay, so underneath classification, it starts at order. What that's referring to is, do you remember your classification? It goes domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So it starts at the order level, and um, it's classified by size and shape, that's your little letter A, type of nucleic acid, and maybe you want to add on there, it could be DNA, RNA, singular, double-stranded. And if there is an outer envelope, they have a virally encoded protein spikes that allow them to gain entry to the cell, gain entry to the cell. Perfect. And then underneath structure, outer protein capsid. So you just need to put outer protein capsid, and then you have everything for B and you have everything for C. All right. So here are some different viruses that you can recognize. The adenovirus, this is commonly used in uh, like a gene therapy because they'll deactivate it. Normally it would give you like the flu and use it as a vector to bring genes into, let's say, our cells. Um, this is a bacteriophage, remember Hershey and Chase experiment? That's when they labeled the uh, protein capsid and the nucleic acid inside, remember with P32 and S35. So this is another virus. And here is the tobacco mosaic virus. It will only obviously infect, infect tobacco plants. And you can see it's RNA nucleic acid and it's protein capsid. Here's the influenza virus. You can see um, it has an outer envelope. It's an RNA virus. And then you can see the protein capsid inside. And to study viruses, what they do is because they, they're obligate intracellular parasites, they will um, grow them up inside of eggs. Um, so that they'll take over the egg cell machinery and get them to make their more of themselves. Okay, so how influenza vaccines are made. And I just thought that you would find this interesting. Um, so for your for flus, so some of them are egg-based, some of them are cell-based, and right here, just the unit we're talking about, some of them um, are recombinant flu vaccines. And this is just a link if you go click on it, if you download the presentation, and you can learn a little bit more about how vaccines are made. Okay, so now let's go to uh, the coronavirus, the one we're reading about right now in 2020 and 2021. So it is an RNA virus, first of all. So you can see the RNA is right here inside, okay? It can cause um, common diseases like cold or respiratory illnesses, and it also has the ability to species jump. So on your notes, um, it's an RNA virus, and let's, add in there right now, I kind of blocked it for you there, with spikes. So those spikes look, look like crowns a little bit. I don't see it, but that's what people say, that these look like crowns, and that's why it's called coronavirus. So on your notes, RNA virus with envelope slash spikes. So the envelope is here, and then you can see the spikes embedded into it. Um, this family of virus is called corona because the crown-like spikes, there are four main groups. And then on your can cause um, um, common diseases, colds, et cetera, as well as respiratory illnesses. Um, some affect animals and some can species jump. So the name, if you, why they call it the novel coronavirus, this is a new, newer strain. And the co part stands for corona, the VI for virus, and then D is for disease, and then the year, 2019. Now, this is, there are multiple coronaviruses. And so here I wanted to show you just a few of those. 
So here you can see the name, okay? So here you can see SARS, right? You can see MERS. You can see what year that it came out. You can see the receptor, how it gets into our cells. And then I think this is pretty interesting. It shows the species of origin or its natural host, right? It's, its natural host. Um, here, um, key to the coronavirus proteins, because this is what we're so concerned about. There are um, these four different proteins. So you have a nucleocapsid protein, you have a spike protein, an envelope protein, and a membrane protein. So right here, the spike protein is what people are concerned about, because this is critical for binding into the host cell receptors. And it's these spike proteins that are changing, right? When you look at the new variants of coronavirus and the different strains. Um, and before I go to the next slide, I want to show you, um, so here is just one of those blown up that you're seeing right here. Look right here, carbohydrates cover the surface of the spike, disguising it from your immune system. So you think, oh, it's no big deal, it's no problem. And so by its ability to do that, then it ha can infect more of our cells before it triggers our immune system. Okay, and if you look right here, the new virus binds more strongly um, than the SARS does to cells. Um, um, even though the spike shapes may be similar. So it has a better um, match with our receptors. So if we look here, um, oh, on your notes, I think we got all of that, good. Okay, so now let's talk about viral reproduction and all the variations on that. So on your reproduction of the virus, um, you have attachment, penetration, biosynthesis, maturation, and release. Now I'm gonna teach it with you um, on the bacteriophage, but we'll just see variations on that for the animal viruses and retroviruses. So attachment first, look at lands, okay? Penetration, that's when it gets its nucleic acid to be inside the cell that we're seeing right here. Biosynthesis is its nucleic acid, whether it's DNA or RNA, it ultimately gets to, it has to be made into an RNA strand that can be read on a ribosome so that that ribosome can translate and build the protein components or any enzymes you need to multiply the viral nucleic acid. So that's biosynthesis. Maturation is you're building the viruses. Our own cells do that for them. And then five is release. So on your notes for attachment, I'd like you to put host specific match, host specific match. For penetration, it is either engulfed, the whole virus will get engulfed, or in this case, um, it's going to inject its nucleic acid inject, engulfed, or injects itself. Biosynthesis, it hijacks the host machinery, hijacks the host machinery, to synthesize viral components, to synthesize viral components. Maturation, you're assembling new viruses, assembling new viruses, and then release, you're gonna exit. Now, it can bud off and keep the cell intact, or it can lyse it, which is what it's doing right here and just bursting out. Okay, so interesting about the coronavirus variant, and let me move myself over here. At the heart of each coronavirus, its genome, okay, is a twisted strand of nearly 30,000 letters of RNA. You know what those letters are, right? The, the nucleotides. These genetic instructions force infected human cells to assemble up to 29 kinds of proteins. So when it gets its genetic code in us, we're like, oh, okay, let me take care of that. What proteins would you like built? And we start building these 29 kinds of proteins that help the coronavirus multiply and spread. When you look at its viral genome in here, and here you can see the spikes, the coloring is telling you what that viral genome codes for. So you can see a large portion of it is just for these spike proteins. Now, the variant that we're concerned about, the new one, the B117 variant, okay, as this one, this mutation is arising, um, Usually a virus, because they mutate so rapidly, they usually get one to two mutations a month. Some mutations have no effect at all, but other mutations can change them and change their spikes so that they bind more readily, okay? And this can come, look right here, other mutation might alter a protein shape by changing or deleting just one amino acid. 
Okay. Then through the process of natural selection, um, neutral or slightly beneficial mutations may be passed down from generation to generation, while ones that aren't as good as attaching are quickly eliminated. So we can see evolution of that. So that's why the big concern about this new variant is that it spikes allow better access to our receptors and to gain entry to our cells. Okay, so how did this variant evolve? So the concern is that some people with weakened immune system can remain infected with replicating coronavirus for several months. They're just like a viral mutation factory and that you could just have a few people who become this viral mutation factory and they're just releasing all these variants out. Okay, some people who are treated with a plasma um, that contains coronavirus antibodies, um, they would have favored then kind of a directional selection, would have favored those that could escape and not be impacted by those antibodies, and then you would have had even more of those. And then it spreads from person to person. Okay, and in class, we will watch a video on the coronavirus. It's a good one. In I'm December 2019. Okay, so um, variations on um, viral reproduction. So again, I talked to you about attachment, right? Penetration, biosynthesis, maturation, and release, right? See if you can recognize those stages right here. Attachment, penetration, biosynthesis, maturation, and release. That's your standard cycle, and that is what's called the lytic cycle. But some viruses have the ability following penetration what they will do is they will insert their genome into the host cell chromosome and remain undetected and every single time that host cell replicates it's replicating the viral genome right along with its own genome and when a virus does that it's called a lysogenic Okay, lysogenic. And then at some point it gets triggered to re-entering the lytic cycle. So on your notes, bacteriophages, two alternative life cycles. Lytic cycle is the standard five steps that we talked about before. And then the lysogenic cycle is, and let me show you another picture for that. Okay, so let's look. Here's attachment, penetration, biosynthesis, maturation, and release. That's your standard lytic. But following penetration here is an integration stage. And so that viral DNA is getting incorporated into that single circular host chromosome of the bacteria. So um, on your notes, following penetration, the integration step where viral DNA is incorporated into bacterial DNA, virus is latent, and it is called a prophage. Think like professional virus. It's a prophage. Um, and it is replicated along with the host DNA. And then environmental factors can trigger it to be released. For instance, if you get cold sores on your lip, you that's a prophage. It's laying latent in your lips right now. And then if you get out in the sun, that UV radiation can trigger it, damage to your cells due to that UV radiation. It's like, oh, shoot, we gotta get out of here because these cells are damaged. And so then it will move out of the lysogenic cycle and then into the lytic cycle. So can trigger prophage, this is little, this is BII, okay? Can trigger prophage to re-enter the lytic cycle, okay? All right, now let's talk about animal viruses, okay? So here, here's an enveloped virus, here are its viral spikes, which get our own cells to go, oh yeah, sure, come on in. So we engulf it, we bring it in, we don't destroy it, we actually unpack it, and then its nucleic acid can then be transcribed and translated. We will use its nucleic acid to build its proteins and synthesize more, which then get released. So on your animal virus, you have number two, A, gain entry in various ways, a um, little further on, then can be uncoded, and viral genome can enter into a lytic or lysogenic cycle. Lytic or lysogenic cycle, and then when it leaves, it just buds off from the host, so it takes a little of our own cell membranes and just coats itself with that. So it can bud from the host during very, um, using various membranes, either cell membrane, it could use nuclear membrane, it could use Golgi membrane, or just lyse the host if it's naked, if it's one that doesn't have a membranous envelope, or just lyse the host if naked virus, if naked virus. 
And we're not done yet. More variations, the very scary retrovirus. Now, the most common retrovirus probably we've talked about before is HIV. Um, so what happens with HIV is it is um, a single-stranded RNA virus. And so here, here it is, it's, gained, it's using its spikes to gain entry. And its viral genome, it still wants to hide, right? But you can't hide RNA in DNA unless you convert it to DNA. And the thing about this retrovirus is it has reverse transcriptase. Now remember what transcription was, right? DNA to RNA is transcription using the RNA to build a protein as translation. So it's doing the central dogma backwards. It's taking its RNA, it has an enzyme reverse transcriptase um, to make DNA out of it. They're not showing you everything here. There's another one called replicase to make it double-stranded and integrase to help it. But it now converts its RNA message into DNA and then insert it, inserts itself as a provirus, provirus or prophage right into our own um, chromosome. And there it remains undetected. We don't even know our cells are containing it to even wipe out those cells that are harboring this terrorist nucleic acid. And every time our cells replicate, we replicate right along with it. That's why people who maybe gained uh, the HIV virus in their bodies, they will get sick initially, just like we would to any flu or cold, and then they get better as the virus starts to hide in the cells and it remains undetected, and 10 years later, they can have complications from it. When it's ready, it'll come it'll you know come out and start getting itself it'll make a copy of itself and get translated on proteins making the proteins that it needs out on our ribosomes replicate its R, its RNA and then you will then it'll just bud off so on retrovirus it's an animal virus example HIV with RNA genome that is converted into DNA within a host cell by an enzyme called reverse transcriptase and it can remain latent for years. And what the antiviral drugs do for people who have HIV is they have to take them regularly on time because it will interfere with any of the enzymes that are used to move it on to the next stage in its life cycle. So it interferes with steps of its life cycle, okay? Okay, I think we got all of that. Next, um, just thought I'd show you a bunch of different viral diseases. You can look through genital warts, genital herpes, mumps, measles, chicken pox. These are all uh, common cold, influenza, SARS, um, diarrhea. All of these can be caused by um, a virus. All right, now let's talk about emerging infectious diseases. These are these are not novel necessarily. I mean, they could be variants of it, but they we haven't come in contact with them before. And while, now all of a sudden they're increasing uh, their range and the contact with humans. And oftentimes it's because we are moving into areas where we haven't lived before and also climate change has a big part of that. So emerging diseases um, causing new or previously uncommon illnesses and they are a widespread disease, a widespread disease. Examples, HIV, West Nile, Hanta, Ebola, I'm sure you've heard of those. The cause of this, um, hang on one second, I forgot to mention this, pathogenicity or virulence. This was of, Jan I took a screenshot January 2021, but you can click on this image here for John, Hopk John Hopkins. And if you do, it'll give you all the latest updates. I just thought you should know that because a lot of times people say, well, this is just the news blowing the numbers up. Don't go to a news source if you don't if you don't feel comfortable with that. Actually, go to where the doctors are and look at the medical sites and look at those numbers and look at those numbers because it's happening. Okay, so where are these emerging diseases coming from? Why are they coming about? A lot has to do with um, our ability to travel. Where you know, a hundred years ago, you didn't have all of that, but travel um, uh, happens more frequently. Viruses have a really high mutation rate and then climate change because the climate is changing viruses that were located just to one region of the earth because the earth is warming 
That's just true, okay? Because the earth is warming, then those the organisms that would be carriers for those viruses, they're migrating to new places and then it's infecting other people. So on your cause, high mutation rates, global travel, right? Climate change, the virus is extending its range. The virus is extending its range. And the concern is that viruses are evolving so rapidly, like you still have to get a yearly flu shot. And the reason is because they mutate. When they get, when they prepare um, your flu shot, they're trying to anticipate what viruses will be out there. And sometimes they're really good at it. And sometimes it changes, right? What is out there. So that's why you get a yearly flu, flu shot because those viruses are mutating so rapidly and it's very difficult to find cures, to find cures. And infectious diseases are sensitive to climate. So as the climate changes, so too will the diseases. So too will the diseases. All right. Now, there's something even smaller that is also <laughs> terrible. So the smallest pathogenic agent of all is just straight up naked strands of RNA. It doesn't even have a protein capsid. And this affects plants, thank goodness not us, it's still terrible for plant crops, and it directs the cells to make more. So there are terrible crop diseases. Now, this, this is a naked single strand of RNA, but because what will happen, or sorry, cir circular, it will fold, it'll take this circular RNA and it'll fold flat, and that's what you're looking at right here. So this is a plant without a viroid, and this is a plant with a viroid, and it just destroys crops. So on your notes, naked strands of RNA, direct cell to produce more, direct cell to produce more. And one more for you, um, prions, um, proteinaceous infectious particles. And if you've heard of mad cow disease, it is similar to that. They basically cause your proteins, they are misfolded proteins. Remember we talked about, right? Post-translation -tra um, and post-translational control. These are misfolded proteins and it causes other proteins to misfold as well. Um, and so on your notes, they are rogue-shaped proteins that cause diseases, TSC. Once infected, it starts a chain reaction that converts other nor normal proteins to prions. It's a cause of TSC. It basically causes holes in your brain, a spongy appearance like mad cow disease. And you have to come in contact with contaminated utensils that have been working with mad cow disease. I don't mean utensils like a spatula. I mean like dissecting tools or the diseased tissue itself in order to get it. All right, hopefully that wasn't too scary. Um, that is the end for this lesson. And if you are, I can't move myself. If you are one of my students, sorry. If you are one of my students, I will, I will keep talking to you. I will see you in class.